much for coming. Um, I really appreciate you all being here. This is such a nice size audience. Um, I, um, like Lindsay said, I just broke my arm and um, I, th I think the color looks like just a bad spray tan. Someone just asked me at Starbucks if I had a bad spray tan. And uh, it's the antiseptic soap. So I got operated on a Monday and then I just took the splint off this morning and started, um, started on my rehab. So anyway, I'm feeling great actually and glad that I got operated on here and not in South Africa, which was one option. So um, anyway, anyway, thank you for this opportunity. Um, this talk is an idea that I've been working on. Um, it's not, well, we'll see if it's the most polished idea. I hope so. I just have um, spent May in London with a group of 14 students teaching a class called the uh, Art, History, and Business of London Fashion. And I started um, off the class with the students um, branding themselves with a collage that they made out of magazine cutouts. Um, I'm interested in the idea of branding, of fashion branding, whatever that term means. It certainly is a popular term these days that's being thrown around like no one's business. Every time I listen to NPR or I read something, the term branding is s said. And I think a traditional meaning for the term branding is, um, I've got one up here, but it's basically a brand logo that sells a product. Um, but I think these days it's used to encompass ideas of how we live, lifestyle branding, how we sell ourselves on social media, how we reinvent ourselves to get a new job, to get anywhere in this world. It seems to be a popular term and something that we all need to think about. Um, young people like my niece, who just finished her first year at the College of Charleston, um, had an awful lot of pictures on Facebook with red solo cups looking a bit inebriated and I had to call my sister and say employers might see this down the line you know these kids are brand I call all them kids but she's not she's an adult not legal to drink of course um, but she's branding herself in a way that I don't think is going to serve her well and I think young people are branding themselves through social media and all of us are living in a world where we have to sell ourselves in various ways at all stages, ages of our lives, and it's something we need to, to think about. And I've decided to try to pull people, 20-year-olds who I teach, into my class of trying to use an umbrella of the term branding to look at the history of fashion. And I have thrown this idea by an art historian friend of mine who's a well-known art historian, and he hated the idea, um, just to let you know. Um, because he quibbled with the term brand and thought image maker was more accurate as a term to define what some people in history have done in order to sort of create themselves through, through, through painting, sculpture, and various types of, of imagery. So I'm using a, the term brand and I'm going to use it kind of loosely today and we'll kind of think about the meanings of it. And I want ideally for you all to kind of relate it to your own lives, I have a little exercise for the end where you're gonna brand yourselves and think about um, how you think of that term and what you might need to use a branded idea of yourself for. And this comes out of, of course, a personal desire of my own, which is that I run the Vanderbilt Costume Shop and you're probably saying, well, does Vanderbilt have a theater department? Do they really have a costume shop? And thus, I think I need to brand my costume shop however that is. So this comes out of my desire to be more recognizable as an entity at Vanderbilt, because no one knows we have a theater, no one knows we exist. We're in the back of a building, and, um, and I'm really finding that young people, 20-year-olds, seem to be very interested in learning how to sew these days. I think the idea of crafting, quilting, I think it's coming back, and I would like to serve as a resource for something that's not thought of as something that's traditionally being taught or done at Vanderbilt. So how do I do that? And ultimately, I would, I'm always trying to think of some way where Vanderbilt will give me a new costume shop rather than the kind of crummy space I'm in. So how could I brand myself to be more exciting, to be sexier, to be, you know, someplace students want to come, and then will Vanderbilt build me a nice big costume shop with some nice big windows? So the ulterior motive behind all of this, of course, is personal desire for a nicer costume shop. <laughs> So it's a very roundabout way of introducing the idea of this cultural obsession, which I do think is a cultural obsession, with branding. And here is a little um, format I found on the internet, which really has to do with branding products these days and how 
retailers are trying to sell things through price, through customer service. Co companies are quickly working on branding themselves to make them want you to buy their products. And um, here is a definition of branding. Personal branding is how you market yourself to others and sequentially how people view you. This can include your choices in fashion as well as life in general. Personal branding is how you carry yourself and in the society how you behave through social media. Developing a brand is important and that it goes hand in hand with developing your overall personal voice and point of view. A brand has to be rooted in something organic and authentic. It can't be created from something disingenuous. A strong brand shouldn't please everyone and is well marketed and clearly communicated. And I wanted to start in pushing this idea of inappropriately calling the work of portraiture of Queen Elizabeth um, branding, or uh, maybe more appropriately, image making, um, by talking about how some royals through the ages have branded themselves um, in order to get what they want or need. Queen Elizabeth uh, I, through her lifetime, she lived from 1533 to 1603, use portraiture for a variety of reasons. Um, one might have been that she was trying to promote um, a, a marriage. These portraits might have been done in order to create um, a, a portrait that could be sent around to various um, aristocrats, royals, in order to find a suitable husband. Of course, we know she never married, so um, this is not actually, um, I think, what any portrait has been said to do, but potentially, um, uh, this is what the portraits were made to do. They were used to show her pow power. Um, they were used to um, show victories, like with the Spanish Armada. They were used to sell herself, a kind of a cult of herself, almost a religious cult, um, uh, the cult of, uh, of Gloriana, to sell herself as um, a, a kind of inspired, sort of almost sacred leader who was all-powerful, all-knowing, and um, therefore someone who was leading her country with a firm hand and knew and, um, knew, uh, and saw everything that was, that was going on around her, someone firmly in control of her country. And um, by doing this, she was firmly in control of her image. Here are some pictures of her from age 13 as a young princess through the age of um, 69. And she actually, at the age of 69 here, possibly looks younger than she does at the age of 13, which is a little suspicious, um, and shows that these portraits are not necessarily accurate or realistic. They are used for the promotion, again, of, of an image. It was stylish to look young, to be thin, um, to be beautiful, and um, therefore, actually, as she aged, her portrait started looking younger and younger. And looking individually at these portraits, here's the first one. I, I love these portraits. I think we're all fascinated with the persona of Elizabeth I, and I think in a way she's fascinating because we live with these images. We've all seen them. And um, you can think of your own branding in terms of what if you have a portrait done that your family's going to look at through the ages and through the generations. How do you want to be remembered? Well, she clearly wanted to be remembered um, as powerful and um, and youthful and also um, really unrealistically. So here in this first image, this is her coronation image, which um, probably was painted in 1600. The first picture probably got destroyed and so this one was, was reworked, um, but would have been original in 1559. Here she is being crowned um, as queen. And um, just going from top to bottom, she's got white lead makeup on. Um, which is kind of creating her face as uh, almost a, a statue, quite unreal. So um, um, she used either egg yolk or white lead in order to get this pale cast. Throughout time, really until the time of Coco Chanel in the 1920s, women um, liked to look pale so that they didn't look like they had been in the sun, which would make it look like you had people to serve you and you didn't have to go out into the sun and do physical labor. Once that pale makeup went on, they actually drew on, if you see this portrait in, um, in its form, uh, in its, uh, the real portrait at the National Portrait Gallery in London, you can see blue veins that have been redrawn onto her temples. And this was to show her skin as being quite transparent. This was another sign of royalty. She doesn't have much of a neck, 
her ruff, um, which is the neck thing uh, around her neck, that pleated eight, uh, pleated figure eight, um, <coughs> stiff um, ruff, really is not even drawn realistically. You can't quite tell what happens after it hits her hair. It doesn't seem to go around her head. Really, the idea of it is that it's holding her head up and, again, making her sort of unable to do physical labor. She has um, a cloth of gold. Her dress is made out of um, fabric that shows her wealth because it's actually embroidered with real gold and real silver thread. And she has um, a coat, a cape that has ermine on it. Ermine is a little weasel-like animal, and each of the black spots is a separate ermine tail. Those poor little ermine, of course, were used in great quantity to make these royal robes. Um, the little ermine, or weasel-type creature, apparently um, would die before it got dirty or sullied itself. And so the idea of using this white fur also has to do with the idea of royalty, that royalty didn't need to dirty themselves or do physical labor, and so you often see regal regalia with um, ermine fur as part of it. She's got um, the orb in her hand, um, a scepter, signs that she is gonna be in charge, and um, rich jewels, including pearls. Pearls were a symbol of chastity and virginity and also wealth, they were very expensive. And um, another interesting thing about this portrait is you can't quite tell if she's standing up or sitting down. She's in a very unrealistic pose. And um, really, again, it's more of an idea of who and what she is than anything sort of realistic about that pose. Um, this is a portrait that's interesting in that it is uh, called the Darnley Portrait, done in 1775 when she's in her early 40s. This is called um, the portrait that was used as a face pattern. Elizabeth was said to have only been painted from life eight times. And beyond that, these face patterns were used to create other pictures. If a portrait artist didn't use one of these, uh, uh, one of these approved face patterns, their paintings were taken away from them and thrown into the palace ovens, apparently. So, um, so this face pattern was used for decades to come. Um, 30 years later, they were still using this as her face pattern. And what I think is interesting about this idea of a face pattern is when you look at pictures of her, her face really looks kind of separate from her body. I mean, it's like a face that's just plastered onto any old body. And um, I think that's true. Again, it takes that idea of what she really looked like, or if she really had this figure in her 40s, 50s, 60s, um, it doesn't really matter because there's nothing really very realistic about the portrait. So this face pattern was one of the um, acceptable face patterns. It could be used facing right or facing left, and then the artist would um, punch holes around the edges, put that, um, put that image with the holes onto their piece of um, chalk paper and then chalk would be pushed through those holes and they would get the outline for the image that they were to work from in painting their picture of, um, of Queen Elizabeth. And when you really start looking at all the portraits and you sort of see the same face repeated over and over, I just love the idea that um, there were really only a few of them that were acceptable. Um, the idea that she doesn't age, of course, is reinforced by, um, by that idea. Uh, another portrait of her later in life, we're just looking at four, is the Ditchley portrait, which was painted by, um, which was uh, commissioned by Sir, um, Sir, Sir Dudley, what's his name? Sir Lee Ditchley, I think that's his name. I'm sure it's in my notes. As an apology, he was um, Robert Ditchley, I think was living with his mistress, which was upsetting to Elizabeth, and in order to apologize to her, he had this portrait painted showing her at his estate in, in Ditchley. Mm, what's his name? Let me see. Where is Sir Henry Lee. Sir Henry Lee has nothing to do with it. He was in Ditchley. So um, she is standing on the, the estate of Ditchley in the country of England on a map of the world showing that she is all powerful, rules the world. And also the skies behind her show her going from an angry state to a forgiving state, from cloudy to 
sunny and also um, shows that she's powerful enough to rule the weather. Um, and uh, again, in terms of the lack of realism, by this time her hair was thinning, either from the arsenic in the white lead makeup or because she had smallpox when she was younger. I've read both things. She was losing her hair. She was wearing wigs. She was using that white makeup. And her body is totally constructed through bombast in her leg of mutton sleeves and then what's called a wheel farthingale that builds out her body plus a corset that is shaping her again into quite an unrealistic form. And lastly, this is the last picture of her at age 70 on the, your right is probably what she actually looked like. And um, this is when her image making was used to its most extreme state um, in uh, this portrait called the Rainbow Portrait. It's been called by uh, a scholar Sir Roy Strong as the mask of youth, branding her as youthful in her old age. The portrait is named after the rainbow in Elizabeth's right hand, which you can hardly see because it's faded with time. As in the biblical story of Noah's Ark, the rainbow is aside from God. The Latin word means no rainbow without the sun and implies that Elizabeth is as powerful as the sun and can create a rainbow. She also has eyes and ears embroidered onto her um, cloak, which is basically the color of the sun, showing that she sees and hears everything and everyone. And then she has um, flowers embroidered onto her bodice, which show her um, youthful, which show her youthfulness, and that she is still young, fit, and beautiful. Um, spring flowers, including pansies, honeysuckle, gilla flowers, and cowslips. The idea of these Elizabethan portraits and this period, of course, I just like it in fashion history. It's such a fun period because it's so constructed in terms of how the body is treated. Um, I just want to include some updates. The students really, uh, what they really like about the history of fashion is seeing how it affects what they're wearing today or what we're all wearing. And here is some runway wear from Sarah Burton from the House of McQueen. She's bouncing. And then um, a uh, Alexander McQueen dress on the right, playing with the idea of the um, pleated skirt and, um, and those leg of mutton sleeves that she's wearing. I think this era is of interest to people in general because of the bizarre shapes that were created. And I just wanted to show you, for those of you who might be studying fashion, how this garment or this look is actually constructed and what people were wearing. I know these are later, but women would be wearing what was called a chemise, a simple linen or cotton tunic. And then they'd be wearing some kind of corset. And um, whether these are for people with spinal deformities or real corsets is sort of um, debatable, but just as for their shock value, <laughs> They're interesting to show women will be wearing a corset. They would be wearing um, layers of petticoats. They'd be wearing a roll bolster, which is a pillow. And then they'd be wearing some kind of farthingale, which could be of different shapes, a bell farthingale or a wheel farthingale. And on the bottom right is something that we made to create a costume from this period, which is like a big platter that, um, that the costume sat on. Women would have what was called a busk down the center front of their garment, and that would kind of hold the corset down so it wouldn't pop up. And what's interesting about this portrait, there is a pin cushion in the back. Women's clothes would actually be pieces of fabric that were sort of pinned in place when they would wear them. And uh, there's an interesting account at the Globe Theater of how at the bottom level they would find all these pins that had fallen out of women's costumes at the end of the night. Um, so I guess, I guess the idea was these fabrics could be, could be reused and, and reconfigured over time. And here are some different types of farthingales that were worn in this period. And we're looking at English fashion with the bell and wheel farthingale. And then on the left is um, a Spanish farthingale, which is supposed to be kind of older in style, but actually looks more like an 18th century pannier, but all these three garments were sort of in fashion at the same time. So you got these very interesting different shapes. And if you wanted to make one of those today, if any of you are costume designers or doing local uh, theater work, um, they make patterns for these things and they're time consuming to make, but you can make your own corset and uh, bell-shaped farthingale 
And of course, there are lots of YouTube videos and all this stuff on how things go together um, and can be made. And um, again, to sort of assert their royalty and their separation from the rest of the world, women wore ruffs, different configurations of them, this sort of figure eight ruff and then what was called a whisk, these um, high stiff collars that were a sign of aristocracy because they'd be made out of lace, which was handmade and very, very expensive. These ruffs had a support structure as well, and there was a little frame that would sit around the back of your head and hold these things up. We did a show, um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead at Vanderbilt a couple years ago, and we had to make a character in this style, and it was all, it, it was all for looks. I think they wore these things year round, so they must have been unbelievably hot. And um, I've read that when people breathe too much, these were made with various kinds of starch and they would made, may, be made with hot curling irons. So if you even breathed or had too much w water in your you know, r r sweat or talking, it would sort of melt them so they'd have to be re-steamed. So even the idea of how they sat and how weather affected them also had to do with your wealth. I mean, everything about them just screamed, this is impossible. <laughs> very immobile. And we see through the ages, really from the early Renaissance, from the er early mid-1400s until the early 1900s, women were dressed in ways that prohibited movement. So it really is the story of fashion history for those years until women go into the factories in World War I and people like Paul, Paul Poiré free women from corsets that the body is somehow altered or manipulated. So it would be very hot and very uncomfortable. And how do you eat without spilling? I mean, it sort of also implies that maybe you had to be fed. <laughs> I would have stuff to... I know, I know. They probably couldn't eat much to, to begin with. So I know they're just, they're just the idea of all this stuff is sort of horrifying and, and fascinating. This was the wheel that we made that sat um, on the woman's hips. That's a costume we did from the period. And when you actually make the costumes, all the problems of, of how these garments actually worked, it's one thing to look at them in a picture, but the weight of the fabric on the farthingale and the actress with the corset, uh, our costume looks nothing like the period because I didn't know, I would have, I didn't know how to use brocade fabric without using tons of yardage that would have made the actress feel so weighed down. You know, I worry about them fainting. Um, so we tried to lessen, plus the cost of all that fabric in making these dresses was so exorbitant. So we tried to simplify the use of fabric for all those reasons. Um, and just trying to get these structures, the bol roll bolster, this big platter, we also had one of these underneath that, it still would somewhat collapse under the weight. This is supposed to sit up in the back. You can see it in the portraits. So I've always loved looking at these portraits and it's fun to actually build these things and really see how these things worked. I never really knew that the back sort of sat up and then to get that to sit up with the weight of the fabric, it's sort of its own, its own uh, dilemma. Um, so there she is again. So our picture compared to all those bits of fabric, all those yards of fabric she has, not to mention that she has about 240 jewels that are individually attached, um, semi-precious jewels um, sewn into that dress. So it really is quite amazing. Our next symbol of wealth and aristocracy is um, Louis XIV, who was king of France, um, lived from 1638 to 1715 in the late, late Baroque period. Here's an image of Charles I painted by Anthony Van Dyck. And you can see that um, Rigaud who painted the image of Louis XIV was probably looking at the Van Dyck portrait in terms of a royal pose um, that he was copying. Exactly, there's much more informality to the Van Dyck portrait than there is to the French portrait of Louis XIV. Louis uh, lived in the period of, uh, of, of the Baroque, um, late Baroque, which was an era of theatricality, splendor, um, 
a, a, a real kind of extravagance, a visual extravagance, and he epitomized that visual extravagance. Here he is using portraiture, and in fact he used image making as a tool to show his absolute rule, um, his supremacy, his importance, his ability to rule um, absolutely, um, the divine right of kings. He was all powerful, no one could tell him what to do or change a law without approving it through him. So really, ultimately, he dictated um, any political or visual um, or change that occurred. And um, this portrait is said to epitomize that power. He's, um, he was a ballet dancer, proud of his legs, and here he is um, looking like he's performing as the King of France with his extra short breeches showing his legs. Some people to get good looking legs would actually pad them out under their tights, but these are probably Louis's real legs. He was five foot four, so he preferred a heel. He has a three or four inch red heel on his shoes. That red signified again that he didn't need to sully his heel or that it would get dirty, symbol of royalty. There's a little cute ermine weasel down in the picture, and those are what go into making these royal robes um, he is covered in luxurious fabrics, silk, um, some kind of silk that's uh, serving as a stage set for him, curtains that are drawn, um, a column in the background showing a kind of classical um, look, um, a classical strength and uh, leadership, and uh, blue, that beautiful blue silk velvet embroidered with the symbol of France, the fleur-de-lis. He also is wearing what was stylish at the time, a periwig or peruke, a, um, a black wig that would go kind of four inches up and then sometimes all the way down to the waist. Louis was very interested in dressing in elaborate ways and he wanted his court at Versailles to dress in elaborate ways also. He was very into the visual effect of his leadership. He also lived in fear that he would get, um, that he would get uh, overtaken or, or plotted against by the people that he ruled and were part of his court. And he figured if um, they had to spend all their time and money on their clothes, that they would have little money or time left to plot their treasonous activity. <laughs> so the whole court was expected to dress in finery um, probably he was expected to dress the finest, but um, that was just a given. And here is an elaborate, uh, I've never been to Versailles, um, but it would be great to go and see his image. He took on as his personal motif um, uh, the image of Apollo, the sun, and he thought the idea of Apollo went along with his ritual risings. And, um, and going to bed, and uh, he felt as powerful as the sun. So the motif of, of um, Apollo is embedded into Versailles and into the Hall of Mirrors down here, um, and in fact is worked into the, um, into the way that the garden is designed. Versailles was sort of his ultimate symbol of, uh, of rulership and um, the kind of power and money that he was in possession of. Here he is as a Roman ruler, and here he is um, as a dancer, uh, forming as Apollo. There's a picture of Apollo on his stomach, and then he has um, the kind of sunbeams of Apollo coming out in all directions. So uh, I'm not sure he was always a favorite ruler, but he sure was theatrical, and um, <laughs> I'm sure was a great performer. And uh, it's in fact, he had an image maker named Charles Le Brun who he hired to decorate Versailles and really create his visual world. So he went so far as to put someone into his employ in order to show his dominance and power through, through his images. And I just wanted to throw, again, a little fashion history in just to show you the movement of, um, of clothing during this period, starting with Henry VIII, just so you can see, and then we're gonna look at um, more contemporary menswear, just to see what happens with men's and women's wear over the eras. Here's Henry VIII, who is the father of Elizabeth I in the early 1500s, and then we move to the Cavalier period, where um, all that bombast and stuffing um, 
uh, actually that's Elizabethan, and then that's Cavalier. The body gets a little more natural looking. And then with Louis XIV, the treatment of the body gets very fanciful, beribboned, beplumed, um, men looking as much like peacocks um, as women, or maybe more so. Um, finally highlighted with Louis XIV, and then we get a kind of a calming down of a men's look in the mid to late 1700s, and we'll see in a few slides where that takes us. And with women's wear, we get that unbelievably artificial silhouette of Elizabeth I, and then Queen Henrietta, wife of Charles I, is here. Um, again, a much more relaxed look after the Elizabethan look which um, sort of builds in um, artificiality. Again, this is during the time of Louis XIV. Men really look kind of more ornate than women did in, in this period. And then women's wear gets more and more confining and structured through the 1700s into the French Revolution. So um, you can see really how the idea of uh, the period of Queen Elizabeth is really as interesting as any for um, women's clothes. And then the last period image maker I wanted to look at is uh, Madame de Pompadour, who is the official mistress of Louis the Fifteenth, and um, she um, met Louis. She felt like she was actually born to be the mistress of Louis the Fourteenth. She was an upper middle class, from an upper middle class family. She was married, but she wanted to catch his eye, so she actually went out to the forest when he was on the hunt and made sure that he took note of her and then had a relative who was in his, in, his, in his employ tell Louis who she was. She was later invited to a costume party and um, caught his eye and became his mistress at that time in the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. She was interested in showing herself as a femme savant, as an educated woman. She used her portraits to um, appeal to Louis XV to actually tell the story of her relationship with the king and, um, and to show that she was worthy of her official title of um, mistress of Louis the, of the 15th, Louis XV. She was in the early 1750s, um, she was actually given a higher and higher position as his mistress and eventually became supernumerary mistress of Louis the 15th. She wanted to tell people through her portraits that she had the education, the bearing, the good grace, the good heart, the talent to really deserve this official title and place. So here are a bunch of portraits of her, the top three done by her favorite portrait artist, Boucher, and uh, the bottom images done by um, a few other artists who painted her portrait. And I don't know if you can tell why she likes Boucher the best. He makes her look the youngest <laughs> and the most beautiful. And um, sort of, again, kind of like Queen Elizabeth, highlights her at her sort of most classic um, time when she was having a sexual relationship with the king and really never lets her age through her portraits. So there is a rundown, and I think 1760, 1759, these are done just a year apart from each other. So again, we look at this idea of branding as not being 100% realistic, but being used um, very judiciously and pointedly. Here's a portrait of her in 1759. There are two types of portraits that were done in which she proclaimed her cultural agenda. And that cultural agenda, by the way, is she really sort of dictated the taste and look of the Rococo period. The Rococo and art lasts from about 1715 to 1775, and she really was the arbiter of, of taste. Her interest and artistic leanings were um, represented in interior design, in furniture design, in dress design, 
Um, so she really had a huge influence on the look of the period, as she did on Louis XV, who really trusted her as, her as his best friend and his confidant. This, uh, this picture is, um, is defined as a domestic court picture showing Madame de Pompadour in um, an elaborate setting with um, luxurious clothing, but, but depicting um, the subject in an activity of daily life. She's out sort of taking a walk, she's out in the garden, she's looking as if she's just read some document that probably has to do with the Enlightenment, and she's very thoughtful. She's always looking quite thoughtful in her pictures, as if she's just been a, in a salon, um, talking about ideas of the Enlightenment. And um, at this point in 17, she had this commissioned in the early 1750s. She, was, she had a sexual relationship with Louis XV from 1745 to 1750, at which time she just became his friend and she actually brought Louis younger uh, women for him to have sexual relations with. At this point, she was just um, had a role of, of being his friend and uh, also making political decisions. So she had the, the sculpture in the back commissioned, which was called Love and Friendship. And um, it shows um, people um, in a guise of friendship as opposed to a romantic um, exchange. She is pictured with um, a little dog, which you can hardly see in the image, which is symbolic of her fidelity to Louis XV as, um, as his friend. And um, she's also showing herself kind of at the height of fashion and um, stylishness in that image. And then this has always been one of my favorite images of her and really gives a look of, um, of what the Rococo period um, was like. Pastel colors, um, she's in an elaborate silk dress which is kind of fanned out around her. Um, women in this era and men powdered their hair. There was a sort of a lightness um, to, to the visual aspects of it, a sort of feminine lightness, a very sort of organic scroll-like um, design aesthetic. And uh, here she is looking like she has just been caught in a moment of, again, intellectual contemplation. She's been reading a book. Um, she has, let's see, I think she has some architectural designs down here at her feet. And she's caught in a moment of, um, of reflection and again thinking about high-minded ideals. Uh, this portrait is called an intellectual portrait, focusing on a woman of the arts, letters, or science in the privacy of her study, cabinet, or boudoir, engaged in scholarly activities and surrounded by emblems of these pursuits. Here is uh, an image of um, some typical visual elements you find in the Rococo period, um, which actually inspired the Art Nouveau period that came in the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, with um, uh, a real interest in um, asymmetry and natural motifs. Madame de Pompadour lives on through her hairdo, the Pompadour, which we see in a Gibson girl image from the early 1900s, as well as Saturday Night Fever and the 1950s. Um, not to mention the Pompadour heel, the um, shoe style. If you looked it up on Zappos, you might use her name to pull up a traditional, well, play on a traditional 18th century heeled shoe. And there is uh, a shoe from 1660s, a beautiful shoe, um, and then one from the 1760s, referred to with um, both a Louis heel and uh, a Pompadour heel. So her name lives on, not to mention her image. When you see images of the Rococo period, this is a statue at Cheekwood. Her face is kind of everywhere, <laughs> so she dictated taste in that period, but she really um, stands for uh, the classic sort of beautiful image of the female from the Rococo period, and I think um, images of her in garden art came in fashion in the 19th and um, 20th century.
Right here in Williamson County, there are working class families living in substandard housing. It's hard to believe in the 13th richest county in the U.S., people are living in rundown trailers and houses with no running water, failing plumbing, and little or no heat or air conditioning. Some working class families are paying over 50% of their income for rent, leaving little money left over for other essential needs such as health care, savings, transportation, or retirement. My kids have gone through so much past two years, and I didn't want to change, you know, with the school and things like that. And I knew I cannot you know, afford to stay in Williamson County with, right. you know, the salary you know, I'm making. But at the same time, I don't have anything else to give my kids other than a good education. So that's my main focus, you know, to be in Williamson County. And then you know, I knew the school and, the, you know, the schools were good. So I wanted to stay here. But again, you know, I cannot afford, you know, to stay here. And I did try. I did try. I was so stressed. That's when, you know, when these people came, it just came like, you know, I was like frustrated with, you know, myself. And then again, this thing came, so it all worked out. I guess my God just worked it out for me. Mm -hmm. You know, you all think like, you know, you're just building a house for me, but, you know, I'm going to make it a home for them, I swear. And, you know, so many people have helped me. So I'm going to come out of this, you know what? So, thank you so much. Habitat for Humanity of Williamson County is dedicated to building and financing affordable housing for hardworking, low-income families who qualify for our home ownership program. The families we serve work in our schools, in our hospitals, in our nursing and retirement facilities, and in the retail and service industry. Habitat of Williamson County partners with local businesses, churches, and organizations, as well as individuals, to fund the building of our homes. Additional funding comes from our restores and special events. The reason building a Habitat house and delivering it to a family is so important to me personally is it allows us to take a working class family and allows them to participate in the American dream of home ownership, which I personally hope will transcend to their kids and their children's kids. What Habitat does is it transforms the lives of the people who are coming and, and don't have their own housing but then now have a home that is their own. Uh, and that certainly transforms their life. But we also feel like our participation with Habitat transforms us as individuals and as a community. Before Habitat families purchase their home, they earn 500 sweat equity hours spending six to 12 months in a comprehensive home ownership program. Their work and dedication transforms them into responsible and very grateful homeowners. I learned from where I was living at um, to have an attitude of gratitude. I, I think this Habitat House can be a testimony of God's goodness and His grace. That's how I think it can change me, it's a testimony. Home means everything to me. I've always wanted my own home, and this is my first opportunity to have my own home, and I'm really thankful to Habitat for making that a reality for me. Me and my children would love living here, and we're going to take care of the property because we're so grateful to have it. Our home ownership program is designed to build a foundation for hope through pride in ownership and belonging, creating stability, increasing the chances of success. What can you do? The solution is simple. Give a hand up to those who are so close to making it. Your investment transforms lives. One of the things I love about Habitat is the, uh, it's sort of a John 6 mentality where the little boy had his five loaves and two fish and whatever he gave was enough. At Habitat, they do a nice job of facilitating whatever you have to give. If you can give this much money, this much time, if you have this skill in this area but not in this area, whatever you've got, whether it's you can work with a hammer or a shovel, it allows us to give what we have and then see what together we can do to produce something miraculous. So that's one of the, the uh, real benefits about being connected to Habitat is it allows us to give what we have and then see what together we can do. And uh, 
The uh, total is always greater than the sum of its parts. By building a foundation for one family, we build stronger communities for a more promising future. And just to look at the costumes from this period, again, I think um, along with the Elizabethan period, these are some of the sort of most interesting shapes from fashion history. These really wide, what are called panniers, the farthingale becomes a pannier, um, sort of um, uh, is, is really more of a court garment than an everyday garment as they got wider and wider. But the women had that same chemise and then a corset, either a decorative corset or a practical corset. And, uh, and then these panniers, a kind of a donkey basket strapped onto each hip, just what we try to get rid of these days, but was very fashionable back then. And here are all different shapes of panniers. Again, the structures of how these things actually get made is just amazing. They're kind of architectural feats. And I've had my staff while I've been away trying to make what was on the right, because I thought it'd be fun for students to actually try these on in class. Because I made a fake one last summer, and honestly, once you get that pannier on, guess what you can manage to do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> you can't tie your shoe, you can't touch your corset, you can't go to the bathroom, no. So you need a staff of people around you to take care of you once you have these clothes on. And I think you don't even realize it until you put the thing on. So I thought if students got to put that on and walk around in it, not to mention not being able to go through doors. Doors were actually designed in this period wider so women could walk through them. And if you notice Madame de Pompadour in her blue dress sort of leaning, I mean, you also had a hard time sitting, so you kind of had to lean in that pannier dress um, in order to sit properly. There is a court version of the dress. You can see how different panels, were panels of fabric couldn't be woven wide enough, so they had to be pieced together. And um, if you go on to study fashion history, a really fun change is into the French Revolution when all this stuff gets taken away and women um, start looking like Greek figures um, for a short time until their body starts getting manipulated again. So, it's my historic idea of, of branding and people using um, image making in ways, maybe you can relate them to ways people are using image making today. Things that aren't necessarily realistic but have an agenda to them. And I thought another idea of branding, this term that actually I think is just a little bit difficult to define, has to do with how we're branded as male and female. And when we look at the court of Louis XIV, who really was more peacock-like than the female, um, we see the opposite happen in the 19th century, when a man named Beau Brummel sets to look for men as a pair of long pants, a white shirt, a vest, and a jacket. And women end up being the ones who visually carry the idea of the wealth of the man and also the idea that you have enough money to have servants to take care of your world. 19th century men all of a sudden were dressed very unlike what we see in the court of Louis XIV in a machine-like way. And I found this information just in one book, but I think it's really interesting. You know, where does this idea of men's dress come from, of men being dressed in just the most basic way? It's hard for men to break out of that. I did see a guy with a skirt on it walking up around at Vanderbilt. He just did not look exactly like he was not out of place. Um, I'm glad he was trying. So um, men's were after 1800 was said to demonstrate an elimination of wasteful motions. Men kind of were supposed to look like machines. They were supposed to look rational. 
They were supposed to reject sensuality and individuality, exactly what the court of Louis XIV seemed to be emphasizing. Their behavior was shown to be goal-directed and based on self-restraint through being in basic colors, all very beautifully tailored and um, dressed in a way that their mind could be on business and not on pleasure. And their attire was to be somber, austere, and non-distracting. And I thought, when you're talking about the idea of branding, couldn't you talk about the idea of stereotyping men as men and women as women, whatever that stereotype is? So here's a rundown of what happens to menswear with an image of um, our first dandy, Bo Brummel, on the right in about 1805, setting the idea of men in long pants for the first time. And once he sets this look of khaki pants, white shirt, and blue blazer, there just doesn't seem to be a lot of turning back. <laughs> and uh, the person sort of who was um, branding the age as an age of conservatism, conservatism and family life is uh, Queen Victoria. I thought I'd better just throw her in there, surrounded by five of her nine children with her husband, her first cousin Albert, and her happy domestic life. And here's what happens to women. When men all turn into Beau Brummel, women are influenced in terms of their fashion by the Industrial Revolution. Men are supposed to look like machines. Women are wearing things that are influenced by machines. The invention of the sewing machine, the patenting of steel, inventions that change the way women dress and appear. And we see from the early 1800s, women's garments changing every, ten, every 30 to five years into the 19, 1830s, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s. Women's wear just keeps changing in terms of silhouette. 1860s with a steel cage crinoline, and then the 1870s with um, a back bustle, 1870s extreme back bustle, and then into the 1890s. Women's wear just keeps changing and into the 1890s, three different silhouettes with the middle being that leg of mutton sleeve coming out of the garment of Queen Elizabeth, 1890s. And then these are my great grandparents at their wedding in uh, their traditional male and female attire. And then we move into the early 1900s with really what's the most severe corset in all of fashion history before women get liberated, almost for good. And I just wanted to show an image of that corset in terms of branding of the female form. While the Art Nouveau period was emphasizing natural form, like the Rococo period was, the body was actually treated extremely unnaturally, and women were pushed out, in, and back, <laughs> and had to walk almost like a pigeon moving through their day um, by a corset which was originally labeled as a health corset, but um, really became uh, quite dangerous in terms of promoting miscarriages, fainting, um, and really a lack of health. So I think we move from historic image makers and branders into the branding of masculine and feminine ideals, which I think um, we're still working on moving through, changing, developing. And, um, and how fashion changes these days is not through royalty, like we see in earlier times, but it's today it's through fashion designers and fashion houses and the business of fashion. Fashion, if nothing else, is a huge multi-billion dollar industry, very complicated. And here is the man who kind of set the wheel in motion, so to speak, as um, kind of the first brander of um, haute couture and uh, ready-to-wear clothes. What we look at on those earlier royalty are one-of-a-kind garments created for those um, members of, of uh, the royal family or mistress of Louis XV. And now we get actually our first named fashion designer who brands fashion in a different way. He brands it with a label and uh, puts his name into his clothes. The whole idea of how fashion gets created 
begins with Charles Frederick Worth in the mid-1800s and um, some novel ideas, which today are things that we're used to, that have kind of branded the fashion industry into what it is today. He designed the first designer label. Um, he created the idea of, of a runway show. He used models. And um, he used himself as a spokesman for his taste and his clothes. Charles Frederick Worth was born in London in the 1830s. And um, sorry, in 1826, he died in 1895. He began his career at the age of 12. He had to go to work because his father had some bad financial problems. He was sent to work and he worked for um, a fabric company in London, um, learned about fabrics, and while he was on his daily excursions to go pick things up, he would stop at the National <coughs> Portrait Gallery, the British Museum, and he educated himself in, in fine art, which he incorporated into his style and fashion as the years went on. He moved to France or Paris in 1856 at the age of 20 and again uh, worked for some silk merchants learning more about fashion and fabric. Uh, and while he was there, he met his wife Marie who he used as a model. He would design clothes for her, send her out into Paris and hope she would catch the eye of the upper class in order to buy his garments, which he did. She caught the eye of the wife of Napoleon III, Princess Eugenie, who started ordering clothes from him, and his business was set. He had a booming business. If you go to any fashion history exhibit, his name is probably going to be there, Charles Frederick Worth. His stuff is held at the v &A, at the Met. If you look up his clothes, um, not only was he such a prolific designer and creator, but his clothes were made so beautifully they've te stood the test of time. Not to mention being worn by people who could afford to have them made. They probably weren't worn that many times, so the clothes have stayed in good shape. But um, before him, women would buy fabrics, take them to their dressmaker, and tell that dressmaker what they wanted. When you went to Worth, whether you were a prostitute, a princess, a queen, or an entertainer, um, someone in the theater, Worth would tell you what you were going to wear. It was a whole new idea. He dressed you. He styled you. And, uh, of course, these days we have celebrity designers who are styling celebrities all the time, but Worth sort of invented this idea. He also liked to look like an artist. He considered himself an artist. Here he is dressed as a businessman on the right, and here he is dressed on the, as an artist on the left in his beret, his uh, velvet cape, his loosely tied cravat and his little um, cute little beret. He was also often smoking a cigar. Yeah, he, does, he looks older. Yeah, he, do, he does look older. I would imagine through his career, you know, there aren't a lot of pictures of him out there. I imagine through his career he was probably photographed both these ways. Let's see, the camera would have been invented in the 1850s. Well, um, he, I think all through the career he was both a businessman and an artist. So let's just say they're pictures that are representative of him. Um, that he said in the 1870s that a dress is the equal of a painting. When these pictures are actually from, I'm not quite sure. But you're right. He looks like he's maybe in his 20s or 30s, kind of just starting out business on the right, and then later as the, the what? What did you say? Father and son. Is it the father and son? I don't think he did have two sons, but I think that's. They do, they do. Well, he had two sons who took the business over. I'm pretty sure these are both him. Um, but uh, he did have two sons, one of whom took the artistic part of the business over and one of whom took the business side over. He was pretty amazing that he had a good mind for business and was an incredible artist. The what? No, the business went, I think the business went out of business in the 1950s. I think that's right. There was a line of perfume um, that I don't think is around anymore, but I think the business lasted well into the 20th century. And then finally, like so many of these businesses did, it sort of grounded out. But for any young person who wants to be a fashion designer, reinventing 
the past, the name of Chanel Dior, mm -hmm. such a hot thing to do. I don't see why someone might not pick up on the name of Worth if you could get the licensing rights to it. Um, but the business didn't, didn't last forever, and I think his era was certainly the, 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 the mecca because I think he was really quite in <coughs> incredible. His designs are incredible. Here's the image of Queen Elizabeth again. And here are a couple of garments that he designed in the center with the leg of mutton sleeve. Having gone to these museums in London and studying fashion history, he would incorporate historical elements into his fashion designs, um, which really is exciting and still done by designers, but he really had a great knowledge of fashion history, so he would play on the past. And here's an Alexander McQueen dress playing on the past. Here is a leg of mutton, a leg of lamb. So when we talk about a leg of mutton sleeve, you can see that that is the lovely thing that it is shaped after. Here are a couple of um, Worth dresses. They're really beautiful. I just saw one in London at the Fashion Museum in Bath. Um, it was this dress that I saw. And he was an architect of fashion because he worked for different fabric companies. He knew fabric beautifully. He had worked in um, London and probably had been around incredible tailors, so he really understood how to construct clothes. He would have as many as 1,200 people working at a time and had to keep track of who was wearing what dress to what event. So he would take pattern pieces and change them out so that really he would keep creating slight variations on those dresses so wealthy women who were all getting dresses for him for an event would not show up wearing the same thing. And he was very inventive. The train on the back of this dress was his invention, a train coming from the waist before the train had come from the shoulders. And he thought it would be more practical to have it come from the waist. He would make things like that train removable so that after you went through some kind of um, courtly event, you could take the train off and wear the dress again. So he made dresses that could be worn practically for different purposes. And um, just looking at the decorativeness of the clothes, the ornamentation on them, the cut, the construction. Um, they're really just incredible. He was said to have designed the steel cage crinoline to lighten up a woman's load who was wearing as many as eight petticoats at a time before the steel cage crinoline came in style to fill out the skirt. And then he was also said to eliminate the steel cage <laughs> crinoline and took it back out of style um, and created a bustle look where he took that crinoline out, had a bunch of fabric left over, pulled it towards the back, bustled it up, and um, created the idea of the bustle. Here are a couple of his dresses. How he could have created so many garments with so much elaborate detail is just in incredible. He had quite a business going. And uh, this idea of, of, of haute couture, high sewing, which implies that you have most hand work on your clothes, a number of personal fittings, um, and that you create a couple of um, fashion shows per year um, was um, something he developed, the whole nature of the idea of haute couture. This is um, what happens in a 20th century fashion, whereas we get naturalism in art and unnaturalism in the figure and I just show them for shock value, <laughs> again, for that branding of the female form. And um, to show you what Coco Chanel, um, the next brander or designer, was fighting against in being her own force of fashion innovation. So young people seem to love Coco Chanel. Everyone seems to know who Coco Chanel is. Um, certainly, she was a, a charismatic, scrappy character. She was born one of, um, I think, six children. Her mother died young. Her father dropped her off in a covenant with her two sisters, where she lived, I think, from about the age of 12 to 18. Um, and she was taught to sew. When she got out of, um, when she got, when she left there, she went to become a nightclub singer and was given the name Coco. Her real name was Gabrielle. At that point, she gained the name 
Coco and started a hat making business through, um, through the finances and support of a man that she was having an affair with. So she used every scrappy bit of um, wild, good looks, innovation that she had in order to brand herself and start a fashion industry and sort of raise, um, raise her place in the world. She branded a whole new look of fashion for women, and that was a look of comfort. I showed those extreme corsets to show that those extreme corsets were pretty much eradicated in the early 19-teens, late, like 1909 to 1911. Coco Chanel's business took off in the 1920s, so we have quite a movement from women being in the quote-unquote health corset to women being put in a Chanel garment, which she created so that women could lead productive lives, drive cars, smoke cigarettes, work, get out of the house, and be dressed for action. Here she is in um, a classic Chanel look where she actually took menswear and men's fashion knit that was used for underwear and made it into outerwear. Thank you. Did I break something? I think, it's, I think that one was already out. <laughs> I break my other arm by the time I'm done. Yeah, that one I think is okay. That I think, thanks. I think all the usable ones are still. <laughs> if I fall, just call an ambulance. <laughs> they told me this morning that's the only thing I can do is fall over a piece of concrete and I'm ready to wrist again to hurt myself. So um, that's probably what's going to happen. Um, so um, here she is, and she had so many innovations. The LBD, the little black dress. She actually popularized the color black, which before had just been used for um, clothes to be in mourning or um, very practical work clothes. She made black a very stylish color. She made knit jersey a stylish fabric to wear. She made strands of fake pearls. We saw Queen Elizabeth in her real pearls. Coco Chanel used fake jewelry and fake pearls in order to um, kind of show you that you didn't have to have all the money in the world to dress fashionably. She put women into um, long pants and um, really was dressing women for the roles that they were sort of taking on in the 20s, the flappers. Um, she bobbed her hair. Women loved uh, how she looked. She got a suntan and um, she was dressed again for life, not for women in those corsets who were defined by their husband's wealth. Here she is um, in her um, Chanel, that standard tweed suit, which was part of her revival in 1954 when she, her business slowed down and kind of came to a halt during World War II, and then she had a comeback in 1954, brought into fashion that, um, that tweed cardigan jacket, which you can still wear, probably just a timeless classic, will never go out of style. And here is her perfume in the middle the best-selling perfume of all time. Chanel branded herself um, through being the first designer to actually name a perfume after herself. Worth had designed a perfume. Poré had designed a perfume, which he named after various fashion lines. Chanel designed a perfume, and guess what she named it after? Herself. So um, that certainly was a good marketing move because everybody knows who Chanel is because that perfume has been and probably will be the best-selling perfume of all times for who knows how long, maybe forever. Here she is with her very unique perfume bottle which really has changed very little over the years. What made her perfume different is that she actually wanted a kind of an artificial scent. Perfumes had been made out of flower extracts before now. She wanted a perfume that smelled like the soap that she remembered using when she was younger. So she actually developed a perfume that had some of the first synthetic scent as, um, as a part of it ever. And she was given different variations to, to test and smell. And she liked the fifth one the best that she smelled. And so she named it number five, named it after herself, and came up with a unique perfume, not only in terms of the name and the scent, but the marketing and the bottling. So she worked off of a kind of a drugstore man's, a man's kind of drugstore bottle and created something very sleek and utilitarian. And guess what? It's still, everything she invents still seems to hold a lot of visual power in, um, in today's world. 
and when we talk about branding um, and this idea of designers using brands, maybe worth at some point Dior, Chanel, um, or come back was 1953. Um, Chanel has been taken over by um, Lagerfeld, and um, here is one of his plays on that classic tweed suit. Some of Chanel's innovations also from her comeback where the quilted bag was a quilted bag with the um, chain handle, perfume, fake jewelry, um, two-tone shoes, sailor shirt. Every time I look her up, I see some other innovation. I mean, does she really invent all, <laughs> all these things? Sometimes I think, are people just making this up? But um, we know the LBD and the perfume and the dress and the suit certainly were Chanel innovations and that she wore sailor pants. Here's an ad campaign for the Chanel perfume. And here is Karl Lagerfeld, who, in rebranding Chanel for a young audience, and I just, some of my students, I caught them at the Chanel counter in Liberty of London looking at pocketbooks, and I know I've got students at Vanderbilt who, if they have a Chanel bag, they treasure it. I had one student say she treasures it more than anything else she, she owns or could ever own. I'm like, well, what do you know about Chanel to treasure that bag so much, but whatever it is, uh, students just love her, and Lagerfeld has clearly done a pretty magnificent job in bringing her into the 21st century. And um, what he does is he plays off of some of her classic ideas. He plays off the tweeds, he plays off the chains, black, um, flowers. She had a camellia flower that she liked to decorate things with, and he has figured out how to keep her brand recognition in place while bringing her look into <coughs> a modern age. And this is kind of genius, isn't it, to be able to do this so successfully. I just scanned these advertisements out of my Vogue magazine that I had at home from this month. Um, Chanel clearly is going strong, and um, I was interested that her camellia has been moved into these kind of plastic flowers. That perfume bottle has kind of stayed the same. Kira Knightley is in, I don't know how that relates to Chanel, but it's sort of, I don't know, has a little bit of a 20s Did you want to look say to it. Her um, that's a good question. He became the artistic director of Chanel in 1983. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how all the business part of it worked. But you know, but Lagerfeld has also been the creative director of Fendi. He's had other projects that he's done while he's been in charge of Chanel, so... Um, Yeah, as well as the Fendi. Yeah, I, I don't know a ton about him, but he'd be worth learning more about because clearly he's a marketing genius. And here's a Chanel watch playing off that classic black and gold. Looks very 20s-esque. I just scanned these out of a modern Vogue. Also plays with that chain idea of the pocketbooks um, and uh, promotes sort of a very wealthy lifestyle in selling the product. No, she died in 1971. 1883 was supposedly when she was born, although the dates seemed to keep changing because she never wanted to admit how old she actually was. And then um, she died in 1971. And then the last designer who I have, and clearly there are five, there are just millions and millions of lots and lots of designers. In terms of the idea of branding, we've gone from historic people branding their own image, Coco Chan or Frederick Worth branding the idea of putting a fashion label in and changing the nature of the fashion industry, Chanel branding a kind of modern ideal, and then Ralph Lauren um, as another brander who's branded the whole idea of lifestyle, um, who goes beyond just branding a product, but he brands a way of life. And I find what's interesting about Chanel and Lorraine is that neither of them were kind of born to the lifestyle that they are promoting. So Chanel was born poor. And um, 
and Ralph Lauren was born Ralph Lipschitz, who wanted to change his name because he didn't like having the name at the end of his name. And uh, change it to Ralph Lauren was born in the Bronx in New York to Jewish immigrant parents and created a whole kind of visual of the horsey set of the elite person who um, lives a, a sort of equestrian lifestyle with polo for a lifestyle that he was not born into. So when we think about branding, we're thinking about people who are creating a niche in the market that they are selling and they figure out a way to invent something that people want and want to buy into. And Loren um, starts off by designing ties in 1966, uh, does a little film design, and um, here he is, um, known for his total lifestyle branding, which includes the sale of home decor. I don't know why I just keep shaking. So January 2015, Forbes estimates his wealth at $8 billion, which makes Ralph Lauren the 155th rich person in the world. And um, branded a whole idea of lifestyle through the Rhinelander mansion in New York. And, um, and that polo mansion, the idea of home furnishings, of the skis that you would wear, of all your horse riding equipment, it's a whole interior world of design that you enter into and you would like to have for yourself. So he really capitalizes on a whole idea of how you can brand an entire lifestyle, again, that he was not born into. Now you can just read this. There is that horsey set from ads of his. And who wouldn't want to be a part of that horse? He said, even if you don't like to ride horses, I wouldn't mind having some of that stuff around the house. <laughs> and a whole rich interior room of luxury, wealth. Looks like you were born into an aristocratic family if you are surrounded by all of his things, along with that sporting touch, which is always a sign of aristocracy. And again, with the fragrance. fragrance. Um, the contemporary nature of branding is that designers, because the world of haute couture is kind of losing its edge and people can't afford it, designers create their fashion lines, show their stuff on runways, and then want you to buy pieces where you're buying into their brand. A pair of sunglasses, a thing of perfume, a pocketbook, look at how much advertising in magazine is all about sunglasses, perfume, and pocketbooks, mostly sunglasses. And uh, these designers are drawing us in, or marketers are drawing us in through buying accessories because we all want a piece of the life that these um, luxury brands represent. And whereas the lives of Queen Elizabeth, Louis XIV, and Madame de Pompadour are not accessible to any of us because uh, it's a way of life that doesn't exist anymore. The idea of the world of Ralph Lauren is accessible to us, even if it's just through a pair of sunglasses. And one thing to think about with branding, and this is something I've just been working with my students on, is um, how manipulated we are by image these days. 20-year-olds, all of us, we live in a world of, of image making and people trying to sell us things and manipulate the way we see things so that we want to buy into a lifestyle that seems more extravagant, more exciting, more luxurious. And um, advertisers and branders have gotten awfully smart. And I just wanted to end, the last thing I wanted to just show you is how we at Vanderbilt um, have been playing a bit with branding ourselves with a production that we did of Much Ado About Nothing in the fall, where we branded the whole thing in black, white, and gold. <laughs> um, everything was based on Vanderbilt colors. This is a story about um, two sets of young lovers, Beatrice and Benedict, and um, Hero and Claudio. And the director really wanted the students to kind of see the traditional life that was being presented to them with these two sets of lovers and to be able to buy into the story in a way by seeing themselves on stage. And 
So this idea of branding, we branded the whole show as um, coming out of Vanderbilt to try to help the students see themselves in it. What's fun about designing for Shakespeare is that his themes are so big and universal, you can usually do something design-wise with them to um, create your own world. And, um, and this was a lot of fun. One thing that was fun about this was there's a lot of fabric out there that's black, gold, and white, so I didn't have to look very <laughs> high and far to find my fabrics, which sometimes when we come up with some esoteric color world is very difficult. But um, we played with Vanderbilt colors, and also the director wanted to um, have fun because this is a, a comedy, a, a bit of a dark comedy, but a comedy nonetheless with the servants. Um, she was also interested in putting designs of Mackenzie Childs, if you know them, a couple in New York who design all kinds of housewares, all in um, black and white patterns, really fun. So she, um, And my mom has an art gallery, and she's always sold Mackenzie Childs, so I was familiar with it. So um, the maid's dresses are all made in Mackenzie and Child-inspired prints. And um, the characters of Beatrice and Benedict are in gold and black, and then the father, I can't remember his name right now. His costume pieces are based on the Commodore himself. <laughs> Our friend Cornelius Vanderbilt and his statue right out on, um, on the Kirkland Circle. Um, here are the characters. Um, Costume-wise, we kind of played with period, again, to try to set a world, but also have the students be able to enter into it. So the guys were actually, I was going to put them in Bo Brummel types of kind of cutaway jackets, but that just seems so old fashioned. So it's a mix mosh of period. The women are kind of in 1950s inspired garments to make them look sort of classic and traditional. And also because the 1950s seems to be back in style with some of the longer skirts, we thought the students could see themselves in 1950s styles. And then the character we had sort of the most fun with was um, Dogberry here, who is dressed as Mr. Commodore. And um, even this guy, one of the guards, his clothes got cut down the middle to be black and gold in his jacket and pants. And um, so there's Dogberry in his um, Commodore mascot costume. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that actor was so funny, I have to say. Um, I thought that was kind of a funny costume. So, um, so this is uh, our play with branding to help students buy into the world of the play. And then, during the party scene, poor Chancellor Zeppos, who did come to the show with Martha Ingram next to him, got to see himself as the, um, the puppet at the party scene, because we branded the party scene with a picture of Zeppos, and apparently he was laughing very hard, thank goodness, or I guess, I guess there'd be no theater department anymore. But there he is um, as a member of the um, party. And just to end with, oh my god. I'll break my arm. Um, uh, here's some ideas of branding for one of my students that I thought were interesting. Well, thank you very much, everyone. It's awesome. <laughs>
and they run each one to the eggs as if they can carry them all on their backs to a home they haven't yet imagined. And the chip teacup with its message in leaves, an omen that beckons bones beneath the blood moon, raising them out of the deep earth to cling to new life. It's what we all want. Sometimes I feel a kinship with a flapping sole on a worn out shoe, knowing the journey isn't over just because the leather, leather gives out, knowing there are more holes in hearts than there are feet to carry them, bare and bleeding to the edge of whatever cliff is waiting. Because every broken thing is waiting, the splintered wind picture frame beside the garbage heap, the sunglasses as I stick my fingers through the eyes, the rods and garden rabbit that sits by the dried up pond, confused by the burn breed, still listening with the one good ear it has left. Get with it by Sally Lee. Oh, lazy one, stop reading, pay attention. For the hours are short, days short, weeks, months, years short. Wherefore the kind thought, helpful ideas, useful act. If not today, last, 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 to the intentions slash pile. What will spur you on? Push your dream into action. This is Rescue by S.R. Lee. I believe Sally was imagining that she was a slave back in ancient Greece when she wrote this. I take her to the fields with me. Now she's outgrown the puppy look. She has tufts of hair in the wrong places. No time for a wrong dog here. She was on her way to death. I took her one night, and no one said anything. Ramus assigned me the furthest post beyond the stone cutters, a longer walk, a silent day, right for me and her. She brings in my food, one rabbit for lunch, two other small animals for supper. I'd take her to the fields with me. They would kill her back at the sleeping place, for we slaves do not have dogs. I sleep in back of the cattle shed. When I must report in, she waits there for me. Ramus is a good overseer, a good man. He knows when to make exceptions. I take care that no one pays me attention. I take her to the fields with me. Yeah. Around the Courthouse by George Spain. Old men sitting, spitting, Old men sunning, funny. Old men sassing, gassing. Old men joking, smoking. Old men piddling, whittling. Old men lying, dying. This one is by Vera Jaar from her book, The Joy of Being. Lift me up. You lifted me up, God, every time I fell raising me up to steeper, higher pinnacles, showing new horizons that I never knew existed within me. This is another poem I wrote. All is well. All is well with the world while I lie in my hammock, watching the squirrels chase with noble intentions or listening to Blue Jay cry, loud concerns for his mate. All is well with the world when the sky is clear blue, wearing the whitest clouds, and air is laden with rainbows of scents, a map for bees and butterflies dancing under the hot sun. All is well with the world when I can lie in my hammock, still as a firewood, that cardinal cloaked bright and red, at arm's length, sits and whistles, endless love for his plain old wife. All will be well with the world when I lie in my little grave, just as I am now, resting in my hammock, amidst a busy world 
breathing and breathing happiness all around thank you for watching poets from the neighborhood we hope you'll join us soon again Thank you.